This talk is about the circle number pi. But what is this number? What early values are found for it? What methods have been used for calculating it? And what are its connections with probability? The number pi is about 3.1415926 and is a little less than 3 and 1 7th or 22 over 7. In geometry, it's the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. Pi equals c over d, and so c equals pi times d. And because the diameter of a circle is twice its radius r, this is equal to 2 pi r. Pi is also the ratio of the area of a circle to the square of its radius. Pi equals a over r squared, and so a equals pi r squared. These formulas hold for all circles, from a pizza to the moon. If you can't remember these first few digits of pi, here are two sentences that might help. In each sentence, the numbers of letters in the words give you the digits. So counting the letters in the words, how I wish I could calculate pi, gives you 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9, 2. And similarly for the other sentence. If you prefer more accuracy, here is pi approximated to 500 decimal places. But we can never write down all its digits, because they go on forever. It's what we call an irrational number. In fact, with the rapid development of computers in recent decades, pi is now known to over 300 trillion decimal places. But there's still a long, long way to go. Early civilizations needed to be able to measure circles and find their areas. Here's a problem from ancient Egypt from around 1800 BC. It was written on a papyrus, which is now in the British Museum. Given a round field whose diameter is nine units, what is its area? To answer such circle problems, their method was to take away one ninth of the diameter, which here is one, leaving eight, and then to square the result to give an answer of 64. Using our algebraic notation, which they didn't have, we start with the diameter d, subtract one ninth of it to leave eight over nine times d, and then square the result to give 64 over 81 times d squared. In terms of the radius, this area is then 256 over 81 r squared, giving a value for pi of about 3.160. And impressively, this result from nearly 4,000 years ago is within 1% of the true value. More than a millennium later, in ancient Greece, a method for estimating pi was developed around 500 BC and was then used for the next 2,000 years. The approach was to draw regular polygons inside and outside a circle and then to calculate their areas or perimeters. This method was used in particular by Archimedes, who started with a regular hexagon, obtaining a lower estimate for pi of 3, and an upper estimate of 2 times the square root of 3, which is about 3.464. He next doubled the number of sides to 12, which improved the lower estimate for pi to 3.106, and the upper estimate to 3.215. Three further doublings then led to polygons with 24, 48, and eventually 96 sides, and to the estimates 3 and 10 over 71, and 3 and 1 seventh, or 22 over 7, which give pi to two decimal places, 3.14. The scene then moved to China. 
Around the year AD 263, Liu Hui continued the Greek method of approximating by polygons, doubling the number of sides from 96 to 192, 384, and so on, up to 3,072 sides, eventually obtaining an estimate for pi of 3.14159. Even more impressively, around the year 500, Zhu Zhongxi and his son doubled the number of sides three more times to polygons with over 24,000 sides and obtained pi to six decimal places. They also improved Archimedes' fractional approximation of 22 over 7 to the more accurate 355 over 113, which also gives pi to six decimal places. This latter value wasn't rediscovered in Europe for a further thousand years. After this, everyone got in on the game as the number of polygon sides continued to double with corresponding increases in accuracy, leading, around the year 1600, to the remarkable Ludolf van Coelen in the Netherlands, whose polygons had over 500 billion sides, giving pi to 20 decimal places. Not content with this, he then increased the number of sides still further to find pi to 35 decimal places. He asked for this latter value to appear on his tombstone in Leiden, and for many years pi was known locally as the Ludolfian number. Around 1700, a colleague of Isaac Newton's called Roger Coates showed how circles can be used to give us another way of measuring angles, which doesn't depend on arbitrary choices of number such as 360 degrees. Here, a radian is the angle theta subtended at the center of a circle by an arc of the circle whose length is the circle's radius r. It is equal to about 57.3 degrees. And it follows that an angle of 180 degrees which corresponds to a semicircle of length pi r, is equal to pi radians. And some other values are given in the table shown here. As we'll see, using radians instead of degrees makes many mathematical results easier to state and prove. In the 18th and 19th centuries, a new and highly successful method for finding pi was discovered and used extensively. It involved the inverse tangent function, often written as tan to the minus 1x, or as arc tan x. Now this next section becomes a little more technical, but hang in there as it won't last long. But in particular, we will need radian measure for our angles. If y equals tan x, then we write x equals tan to the minus 1y. For example, the tangent of pi over 4, that's tan 45 degrees, is 1. So tan to the minus 1 of 1 is pi over 4. And the tangent of pi over 6, that's tan of 30 degrees, is 1 over the square root of 3. So tan to the minus 1, 1 over root 3, is pi over 6. And we can also combine different values of tan to the minus 1 by using the addition formula shown here. For example, to add tan to the minus 1, 1 half, and tan to the minus 1, 1 third, we get tan to the minus 1 of a half plus a third over 1 minus a half times a third, which simplifies to tan to the minus 1 of 1, which is pi over 4. Many mathematical functions can be written as infinite series. For example, we can write 10 to the minus 1 of x as the infinite series shown here, with only odd powers of x appearing, and with odd numbers as denominators. This series had already been known in 15th century India, but is now often named after the Scotsman James Gregory shown here, who rediscovered it 300 years later. If we now let x equals 1, 
we get a series expression for pi over 4, a result that was also known in India, but is now usually credited to the German Gottfried Leibniz. This is one of the most remarkable results in the whole of mathematics. By simply adding and subtracting numbers of the form 1 over something, we get a result involving the circle number pi. But unfortunately, this series converges so slowly that we cannot use it to find pi in practice. For example, adding and subtracting the first 300 terms of the series give pi to only two decimal places, while for five decimal places, we need the first half a million terms. But we can use Gregory's series to estimate pi if we substitute values other than 1. Remember that tan to the minus 1 a half and tan to the minus 1 a third add up to pi over 4. And so we can substitute the values x is a half and x is a third into the series for tan to the minus 1x giving the two series shown here. And because of the increasing powers of 2 and 3 in the denominators, these series converge much faster, yielding good estimates for pi. Are there any other tan to the minus 1 results where the series converge even faster? In 1706, the Englishman John Machin used the addition formula several times over in order to prove the result shown here. And he then wrote out the 2 tan to the minus 1x series below. Now these series converge rapidly because of the powers of 5 and 239 in the denominators. For example, taking just three terms already gives us two decimal places. Also, 5 is an easy number to divide by so that Machin was able to calculate pi by hand to 100 decimal places, a great improvement on anything that had gone before. Indeed, 1706 was a good year for pi. As well as Machin's remarkable result, a Welsh mathematics teacher called William Jones wrote a book in which he introduced, for the first time, the symbol pi for measuring circles. Here are two extracts from his book. Above, you can see Machin's series with its fives and 239s, followed by the first ever appearance of pi. And below is Machin's value for pi in full, described as true to above a hundred places, as computed by the accurate and ready pen of the truly ingenious Mr. John Machin. Let's now have a complete change of pace and look at a very different way to approach pi. It takes the form of an experiment and is due to the French naturalist and mathematician Le Comte de Buffon, shown here. Suppose you throw a large number of needles or matchsticks of length L onto a grid of parallel lines at a distance of D apart and record the proportion of the needles that cross a line. It can then be proved that this proportion is 2 over pi times L over D, from which we can calculate a value for pi. Here, for example, L over D is 4 over 5, and exactly 5 of the 10 needles cross lines. So 2 over pi times 4 over 5 equals 5 over 10. This gives us pi equals 3.2, which isn't too bad a result for only 10 needles. Indeed, as we've already seen, the number pi turns up in unexpected places. Here are two from arithmetic. If we choose two whole numbers at random, they may or may not have a common factor. For example, 12 and 14 have the common factor 2, whereas 12 and 13 have no common factor other than 1. Amazingly, the chance that two whole numbers chosen at random have no factors in common is 6 over pi squared, involving the circle number pi. 
Moreover, the number 12 equals 2 times 2 times 3 has the repeated factor 2, whereas the number 15 equals 3 times 5 has no repeated factor. And in general, the chance that a given whole number chosen at random has no repeated factor is again 6 over pi squared. To conclude, I'd like to show you a puzzle which dates from the 18th century. If you haven't seen it before, you may find its answer surprising. The circumference of the Earth is about 40,000 kilometres. Assuming the Earth to be a perfect sphere, suppose we now tie a piece of string of this great length tightly around the equator. We then extend this exceedingly long string by just 2 pi metres, that's about 6.3 metres, and prop it up equally all around the Earth. How high above the ground is the string? The resulting gap must surely be extremely small. Let's find out. If the Earth's radius is r metres, then the original string has length 2 pi r. When we extend it by 2 pi metres, the new circumference is 2 pi r plus 2 pi, which is 2 pi times r plus 1. So the new radius is r plus 1, which is 1 metre more than before. So the string is a whole metre off the ground. And in fact we get the same answer whether we tie the string around the earth, around a tennis ball, or any other sphere. And with that surprising result, may I thank you for listening.